Jump King is a game about perseverance. It's a simple game in theory, just make your way to the top of the tower. But between the start of the climb and the end of the map, countless hours of frustration and pain await. The amount of precision that you need to master this game is unreal. Only a few frames separate victory from a devastating fall. It's a famously difficult platinum, certainly 10 out of 10, and an expected playtime of over 100 hours. There's no RNG involved, it's all about execution. So it's time to get good and start our platinum journey. There are three maps in Jump King, and the first step in the Platinum journey is to reach the top of the first map in the game and get used to the controls. We start our climb down here in Red Crown Woods. There's basically only one mechanic in Jump King, and you guessed it, it's jumping. You can jump left or right, and you jump further the longer you hold down the jump button. The thing is that there's a maximum distance that you can jump. If you hold the jump button for longer than around two seconds, you'll automatically jump. We'll call this a max jump, and a big part of the game is learning setups to be able to safely rely on max jumps to get to the next screen. <laughs> I quickly get my first trophy of the game as I fall for the hundredth time, still in this starting section of Red Crown Woods. Not off to a great start. As I slowly start to learn the timing of my jumps, I make my way out of Red Crown Woods and into the Colossal Drain. I get a few more trophies in this section. I perform my thousandth jump as I scale these pipes, and I get another trophy for falling through a fake wall. Take note of this raven hanging out on these cages. We'll eventually have to chase this raven around all over the map, but for now I'm focusing on just getting to the top of the tower. We continue to make our way up the map into False King's Keep. This section is actually relatively short, but it teaches you the important mechanic of bouncing off walls. Many of the jumps in this section are freebie full jumps, and you just have to know where to stand to bounce appropriately. There are a couple of tricky jumps towards the end, and I definitely fell a lot here, but eventually we make it up to Bargainburg. In Bargainburg, we get a trophy for listening to the shopkeeper talk. Right now, we don't have any money, but we'll eventually chase the raven around the map to get the gold that it's carrying. Bargainburg also introduces the first truly difficult jump of the game. This jump is known as Chimney Jump. There's really no setup that you can do to make Chimney an easy full jump. You need to just eventually learn the timing. So it's no surprise that I get the trophy for my 1000th fall as I fail a Chimney attempt. But eventually, I make it through Chimney, and the rest of Bargainburg is pretty easy. Some of these jumps look tight, but again, a lot of them are free full jumps. You also begin to learn which jumps are super dangerous. For example, you have a lot of room for error on this jump, but if you happen to mess it up, you fall all the way through to the bottom of Bargainburg and need to take another shot at Chimney Jump. On the other hand, some jumps are more lenient. This next section is called Great Frontier, and it has some hard jumps, but when you fail them, you don't fall too far. It's actually pretty clever game design. Over the course of the map, there are a handful of very high stakes jumps that are catastrophic to fail, but for the most part, many failed jumps will only set you back a screen or two. As I learn to navigate the Great Frontier, I get a trophy for talking to the Hermit at the top of the mountain for the tenth time. <laughs> this can give you a sense of how many times I'm falling and needing to climb back up. I pass by this guy at least ten different times on my way to the top of the tower. Alright, so we're into the next couple of sections of the map, Windswept Bluff and Stormwall Pass. These sections include two new mechanics to the game. The first is this wind effect that changes the trajectory of your jump. <laughs> Honestly, I wasn't a fan of this mechanic. It slows down the game as you have to wait for the wind to change directions, and it's really hard to get used to your new jumps. The other mechanic that's introduced is these snowdrifts. You can't walk through the snowdrifts, so you have to do these little mini hops to move around. This wasn't nearly as annoying as the wind, it basically just made it trickier to get your positioning right for your full jump setups. Anyways, I get a trophy for my 10,000th jump as I fall flat on my face in this wind section. After a lot of frustration, I'm only a few jumps away from making it into the chapel. This is a huge milestone because the chapel acts as a bit of a checkpoint. It's basically impossible to fall back down into the wind section once you make it up here, and the game is nice enough to give you a trophy for making it into the chapel. From here, we're almost at the top. We've got the chapel, this ice section called Blue Ruin, and then the final part of the map simply called the tower. Honestly, none of these sections were insanely difficult compared to the middle part of the map. I think this is mostly a mental thing. Knowing I reached the checkpoint at the chapel made me a lot less nervous when making some of these trickier jumps. I still fell quite a lot, and it would be especially painful when I was so close to the end, but eventually I got there and beat the first map. It took me over 9 hours to make this first climb. Not horrible, but I would need to improve drastically to eventually get the Platinum. Luckily, my experience on this first run immediately paid off. There's a trophy for finishing the game for a second time, so I started my climb all over again. I ended up finishing the map in under an hour, getting me two trophies when I reached the top. I was feeling pretty good. My second run was nine times better than the first. Alright, so now let's talk about this bird, which is the last thing that we need to focus on in this initial playthrough of the first map. If you chase the bird around the map, it will eventually drop a coin. You need ten of these coins to buy some shoes from the shopkeeper. 
So I began this grind to chase the bird again and again. Here we get a trophy for chasing the bird all the way to the top of the chapel for the first time. After picking up the coin, we can restart the map and start the chase all over again. During this grind, I got a trophy for hitting 20,000 jumps, and I got another one for beating the map under 15 minutes. I was starting to get really good at these early sections of the map. Eventually, we finally get the 10th coin and can go back down to buy the special boots. This gives us two trophies, one for spending the money to buy the boots, and another for putting the boots on. We get one more boot-related trophy for getting all the way to the top of the tower while wearing the boots. We're almost done with this first map. There are three more miscellaneous trophies that we want to pick up before starting the next one. The first is another full playthrough of the map. This time, we have to get to the top of the tower without touching the bird at all. This was no big deal, as I now had a ton of experience, but I just had to be careful to avoid the bird here at the very start of the map. The other two trophies were super annoying. You need to talk to the old man at the start of the level 10 times, and then eventually 50 times on a single run. But it is really tedious to get him to talk. The quickest way to do this is to exit to menu and then jump back in. I'm not quite sure why they added these trophies. It was definitely an annoying grind. And with that, we're basically done with the first map. We'll eventually have to come back for one of the hardest trophies in the game, which is making it to the top without falling a single time. I actually tried this right here, but I could barely get past Chimney Jump, so I figured I wasn't good enough and wanted to get more experience with the game. So on to map 2. Map 2 is called New Babe Plus. I'll quickly walk you through the different sections of the map along with the trophies that I get on my first run. You access the new map by taking the secret passage right after Chimney Jump and we immediately get a trophy for finding the secret entrance. This map is sort of the opposite of the original map. Most of the gimmicky sections are at the bottom, and the precise jumping is near the top. As we're making our way through these initial snow and ice sections, we're once again chasing a bird throughout the level. There's definitely a pretty big step up in difficulty for this map. These first sections definitely take some time to get used to, but things get very precise in Underberg, this new wind section. It's a long section that requires a lot of patience as you wait for the wind to swing back and forth. There are a lot of setups that you can use to make this section easier, like doing full jumps directly into walls, which bounce you perfectly to the next platform. Take a look at this one in particular. This jump is known as Chimney Jump 2.0. During my first climb, I used this strategy of full jumping into the wall. This gets me into the chimney every time, but you'll notice that I fall flat on my face. This counts as a fall, so I'll eventually need to learn a different strategy when playing through this map going for no falls. But for now, I'm going to continue to use this strategy as I'm making this first climb. The very top of Underberg had this super stressful jump to the middle of the platform. It took me a while to get the timing right, especially with the wind blowing. I eventually learned there's a consistent way to get to this platform with a full jump, but for now I didn't know it, so I was doing things the hard way. But we finally land this jump and make our way into the toughest section of the map, the Lost Frontier. We immediately get a trophy for reaching this section and turn our eyes to the new challenge. It's a bit hard to describe what makes Lost Frontier so difficult other than the fact that it has about 10 really precise jumps over the course of 4 or 5 screens. There's very little wiggle room, and the timing for each jump is slightly different. Take a look at my clock here as I spend more and more time falling back down to the start of the section. But we eventually make it through and enter Hidden Kingdom. This is a big landmark because like the chapel in the first map, this serves as a kind of checkpoint. It's a bit hard to fall back down to Lost Frontier, except for one very devilish jump coming up. Hidden Kingdom is pretty easy, its mechanic is invisible platforms, but once you know where they are, it's not too tough. By the way, as we've been climbing, we've occasionally been going out of our way to pick up silver coins. Here we are picking up one in Hidden Kingdom. There are 10 silver coins in the level, and once we get all 10, we need to fall all the way back to Lost Frontier to buy some new boots. This is the last jump in Hidden Kingdom, and it's the devilish jump I was talking about earlier. If you overshoot this platform, you fall all the way back down to Lost Frontier, so I was very, very careful every time I had to make this jump. After we make it out of Hidden Kingdom, we have to jump up through Black Sanctum. This is probably the second hardest part of the map. Again, these platforms are just really tiny. Luckily, there are more free full jumps in this section than in Lost Frontier, but it's still quite hard. Along the way, we pass this very sinister snake, and we'll have to come back to him once we finally catch that white bird that we've been chasing. After passing the snake, we get another trophy for making it up to Deep Ruin. This section introduces the only new mechanic of the map, water. Water basically changes your jump timing. Everything slows way down. A full jump now takes about twice as long to charge. Honestly, Deep Ruin wasn't that bad because it's mostly full jumps. That being said, it's surprisingly tricky because it throws off your timing once you get out of the water. We collect our 10th silver coin near the end of Deep Ruin, so even though we're almost at the top of the map, it's time to fall all the way back down to spend our money. The white bird also starts to go back down the map, so as we're falling, we'll try to keep chasing the bird. Once we're back at the hidden shop, we can spend our 10 silver coins and get a trophy for wearing the giant boots. These boots aren't just cosmetic, they're actually very important for the platinum, and we'll get to that in a bit. We also chase the bird all the way to the bottom of the level, where it finally drops the blood red stone. We need to turn this stone into the snake, so it's time to climb all the way back up. When we make it to the snake, he gives us the snake ring, and we get another trophy. 
Just like the boots, this ring is also an important item for later in our Platinum journey. And with that, we're done with all the miscellaneous trophies on the map, so it's time to finally make it to the top of the tower. After getting to the top of Deep Ruin, we entered the last section of the map, the Dark Tower. This section actually isn't too bad if you know some nice setups. There are a lot of fake walls and floors, but after learning the route, we finally make it to the top and get another trophy. It took me about 12 hours to clear this map for the first time, but to be fair, I did a lot of backtracking to catch the bird and buy my shoes and do those miscellaneous tasks. With the second map done, instead of starting the third map, I instead focused on a few trophies related to the giant boots and snake ring. For every map, there's a trophy for getting to the top of the tower while wearing each of these items from the very start. These items change the way the game is played. The giant boots make it so you can't walk. It's like the entire map is covered in deep snow. This basically means that you need to do these mini hops to reposition yourself, and it makes setting up your full jumps a lot trickier. The snake ring, on the other hand, makes the entire map icy. Before starting these runs, I first get a trophy for wearing both items at the same time, and then I decide to start my first giant spoot run on the first map. Honestly, these runs were probably my least favorite part of the Platinum. I suppose to give these items some credit, they definitely changed the game in an interesting way. While wearing the giant boots, you have to be a lot more tactical with every jump. Your goal is to no longer just successfully make the jump, instead you need to successfully make the jump and put yourself in a position to make the next jump as easy as possible. Basically, you need to think ahead a little bit. Wearing the snake ring is a bit more execution focused. You basically need to become really proficient at this new mini hop technique. After every jump, you want to quickly jump in the other direction to cancel out your momentum. It's absolutely necessary to learn this technique for jumps where you're landing on a super small platform. But even though it adds some interesting gameplay, more than anything else, it just makes the climb feel more like a grind. Basically, you just fall way more often. By this point, I could consistently clear the first map in under 15 minutes, but it took me about 3 hours to clear it with both the giant boots and the snake ring. I was definitely glad to put it behind me. I'll eventually have to clear the second map when wearing the boots and the ring, but before jumping into that grind, I decided to check out the third map to see something new. Overall, I think the third map is slightly easier than the second one. Once again, you find your way into the map through a new door early in the original game. The first section of the map is the Philosopher's Forest. It's not too long, and it's mostly easy jumps. We get a trophy for talking to the bearded gnome and getting his hat. We also spend some time hunting mushrooms in the forest, and get a trophy after turning nine mushrooms into the gnome. After the lightness of the forest, things take a pretty dark turn as you're forced to fall deep into this bog. It's a dark, depressing, and this bug down here has a terrible attitude. You're underwater, so your jumps take a while to charge, and there's also deep snow, so you have to hop to move. On top of all this, pretty much every fall sends you back to the bottom of the bog. It's pretty brutal, but honestly, the atmosphere is kind of amazing. You definitely feel a sense of despair that you don't feel in the other maps. Here's a helpful trick for this section. If you have the snake ring, throw it on. That will let you walk through this deep snow and generally makes this section a lot easier. After finally making it out of the bog, we find ourselves in Molding Manor. This section of the map has four invisible ghost fragments that you can pick up and return to this guy at the bottom of the manor. When you do that, he gives you some new shoes, and we get two trophies for wearing our full gnome outfit. Molding Manor looks tricky, but a lot of these jumps have setups to make them easier. Overall, not too bad. Molding Manor leads to Bugstock, a fly-infested, slippery area. We get a trophy for continually chasing this bug around the map. You need to scare him away 39 times for him to drop his note and get a trophy. Luckily, he can only fly to three different sections of the map, so you don't have to go too far, and it certainly gives you a lot of practice on these sections. Next up, we have the House of Nine Lives. For me, this was one of my weaker sections of the map. It feels like these jumps shouldn't be too bad, but I tend to struggle with them for some reason. Especially this screen where you need to land three hard jumps in a row. Along the way, we get a trophy for finding a hidden cat in this section of the map. I thought we were getting near the end of the map when we get to this new section, the Phantom Tower. This section looks like the final towers from the other two maps, but after getting to the top of it, all we find is this red bird that we've been chasing, and it flies away. It turns out we have more to climb as we start making our way into the clouds. Up next we have Haunted Ruin, and it has one of the most devastating falls in the entire game. The main mechanic here is these waterfalls, which slow you down as you pass through them. It's all just a visual trick though. They don't actually change the trajectory of your jump very much. If you can convince yourself that the waterfalls aren't there, you'll do a lot better. We get a trophy for meeting this gang of imps, but check out this fall. If you fail any of these jumps on this screen, you fall all the way back down to the start of Phantom Tower. It's three jumps in a row with very high stakes. I eventually got the hang of them, and they aren't too precise, but the first few times I failed these, it really drove me crazy. There are some more tricky jumps towards the top of Haunted Ruin, but we eventually find the source of the waterfalls, the mouth of this giant. I really love this screen, I thought it was the best one in the entire game. After climbing on these birds, we finally make it to the last section of the map. And it's here where the game throws us one final curveball with this new quicksand mechanic. For me, this was by far the toughest section of the map. It took me so long to get the hang of this. It's super difficult to learn how to jump through this stuff, 
because as you're charging your jump, you sink into the quicksand. All of your gained experience kind of feels useless in this section. I struggled through the quicksand with a lot of falls, but eventually I made it to the top of the tower and got two trophies. The first trophy pops because I chased the red bird all the way to the top of the tower, and the second pops for just beating the map for the first time. Overall, this map is definitely the most punishing map in terms of devastating falls, but the actual jumps that you need to land aren't quite as bad as the second map. I actually think it's an interesting little bit of game design. Some players might prefer really difficult jumps, like some of the areas in map 2, while others might like the tension of easier but very dangerous jumps in map 3. For me personally, I think I preferred the precise platforming found in map 2. The next step of the Platinum was to bite the bullet and complete the snake and boot runs on the second and third maps. There's not a ton to say here, other than that these runs sucked. I actually found the giant boots to be a little bit harder than the snake ring on these runs. I was so reliant on setting up these pixel perfect full jumps, and with the giant boots, you really couldn't do that setup. So some of these free jumps turned into low percentage jumps, causing some annoying falls. The snake ring made for some tricky areas as well. This jump in particular drove me crazy. I just couldn't stop my momentum quick enough and consistently went flying over the edge. After putting a few hours into each run, I popped these four different trophies for the boots and ring on each map. With these runs out of the way, we now have one major roadblock between us and the Platinum. We need to complete each map without falling. As I started these runs, I was curious about what counted as a fall. It turns out you get a fall when you land flat on your face, which happens when you fall for about half a screen. There's a slight caveat here though. If you happen to land on a sloped surface right at the end of your fall, this slope will cause you to land on your feet. This actually can save a couple of your runs, so if you're going for these trophies, don't abandon your run until you actually see yourself fall flat on your face. So I went back to the first map, and I was pleased to find it relatively easy. I had a ton more experience in the game since the last time I played this map, and I honestly kind of breezed through the no-fall run. The big blockers were chimney jump, and this one tricky wind jump. I failed a few times on each of those jumps, but once I got a run that made it to the chapel, I actually cleared the no-fall run on my first try. But with this run out of the way, it was time to turn our attention to the no-fall runs on the other maps. These trophies were ridiculously difficult, but they're exactly the type of challenge that I love. To me, it's so addicting to find yourself slowly making progress on a seemingly impossible task. As I began practicing the other maps, I decided to do full runs all the way to the top, even if I got an early fall. I wanted to practice the entire map, rather than constantly restarting and only getting experience at the start. As I started these runs on the second map, I felt like a good run was about 20 falls. But I slowly got better and better. My personal best went from the 20s to the 10s, and eventually I was able to consistently pull off runs in the single digits. Remember earlier in the video, I showed my consistent strategy for Chimney Jump 2.0. This strategy causes you to fall, so for the no-fall run, I had to learn this new setup. This setup is basically pixel perfect, so I learned to use pause buffering to start my jump at the exact right time. If the wind is blowing to the right, and you start your jump at the right time, then a full jump will put you right into the chimney. I always aimed for the frame where the gap between my boots was right on the edge of the ledge. It took some time to figure out, but eventually I got to be pretty consistent. Other than that, I found the two big blockers to be Lost Frontier and Black Sanctum. I could feel my heart race every time I made it through Lost Frontier without a fall, and after days of practice, I made it through Black Sanctum without a fall as well. Unfortunately, I had two of these runs fail at Deep Ruin, one of the easiest sections of the map. The pressure just got to me, and I choked on some of these easy water jumps. But I persevered and finally made it to the very last section of the map. Here I am being incredibly careful to set up my phone jumps. You have a few pixels of wiggle room, but I really took my time to make sure I was in the right position. I actually found that wearing the snake ring made it easier to scooch a few pixels at a time, so you'll see me take the ring on and off as I'm adjusting my position. Here I am making my way to the final jump of the map, and the pressure is mounting. And I ultimately missed the jump. It was honestly devastating. I felt so bad. One jump away. But I picked myself back up, and within the hour, I had another run make it back to that final jump. I took a breath, made sure to not undershoot it this time, and I landed the jump. It was such an incredible feeling to make my way to the top of the tower and finally collect this trophy. I think this trophy took about 12 hours to get, definitely rivaling some of the hardest trophies in Super Meat Boy Forever. All right, and so we are now one trophy away. Well, actually, there are a few miscellaneous trophies that we'll pick up as we're practicing the third map. The first one comes as I try on some cosmetic items I had never worn before. Honestly, I didn't even realize this was a trophy I was missing. And the other two trophies come from beating this third map in under an hour and under 30 minutes. I got these as I was slowly improving on my no-fall runs for this map. But this third map truly almost broke me. The big challenge here is that the hardest part of the map was by far the last two sections. The map is just really long, 
and even though there are some easy sections at the start, it was still quite rare to have a run make it to Haunted Ruin. And once I got here, there are so many tricky jumps in a row. Over the course of a few days, I slowly increased my personal best. Here, I fall on one of the easier jumps of Haunted Ruin. A few hours later, I'm back, and I make it a little bit further. This one was particularly painful. I'm past the hardest jumps in the map, and I thought I was in the clear, but I choke on an easy jump. As I was slowly making progress, I learned a few new strategies. The biggest one was definitely bog skip. If you do this setup correctly, you can full jump from this precise pixel and you'll get a nice bounce as you're falling into the bog. This skips a couple of screens, which was really appreciated because the bog is so tedious. I suppose it's worth pointing out that this trophy isn't actually a zero fall run, instead it's a two fall run. There are two forced falls early in the level that you can't avoid. Anyways, I continued grinding away for days and days. I'm not exaggerating when I say this trophy is the most time-consuming challenge on my entire trophy list. I think I was approaching 20 hours of practice when I finally made it to the quicksand tower for the first time. I was determined to beat it in one shot, so I locked in. I had practiced a lot on this section and gotten pretty good, so there were only a couple of jumps that I felt were really dangerous. But every time I got to one of these jumps, I held my breath, and I could feel the tension mounting, and luckily I made it through them. Finally, I made it to the last screen of the game. This first jump over to the left half of the screen is actually an easy phone jump if you know the timing. But the final jump of the game is super tricky. I took a breath, practiced my timing a few times, and finally went for it. I was almost too stunned to celebrate as I landed this jump. I quickly rushed to the top of the tower, claimed my last trophy, and the platinum popped. I took a huge sigh of relief. It was finally over. I think this game was slightly easier than Super Meat Boy Forever, but it was about 10 times as frustrating. I ended up with almost 180,000 jumps and just under 9,000 falls. I'm very proud to have it on my list, but I'm happy to never play it again. Thanks for watching and subscribe to my channel for other hard platinum videos.